Welcome to Legends of the North Cascades, a reading with author Jonathan Evison, a BEMA Art Speaks online festival event. Thank you for joining us. We begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the ancestral lands of the Suquamish peoples. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's central Salish seas as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish live and protect the waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. Art Speaks Online Festival features fun programming all week long. To find out more, follow BEMA online on Facebook or at www.biartmuseum.org. We are grateful for the generosity of our members and donors, as well as the PRISM Fund and Kitsap County and Bainbridge Island LTAC funds for making Art Speaks and tonight's reading possible. Tonight, author Jonathan Evison reads from his forthcoming novel, Legends of the North Cascades. A New York Times best-selling author and all-around interesting guy, Bima presents Jonathan Evison. So, welcome to my garage. Uh, this is where the magic happens. Uh, I call this the war room over here. Um, this is where I do, I do all my logic work, my outlining, my structural stuff, which uh, it kind of varies how much of that sort of work there is depending on the, on the book. Um, but right now I'm working on a book called Small World, which has got uh, 28 limited points of view uh, and covers 170 years of American history. So it gets pretty confusing. Like I gotta have all these sorts of lists. Uh, some, some of these are, it's color coded by character or narrative strand. Uh, some of the lists are just lists of uh, all my characters' birth dates for continuity, so I don't always have to go back. Um, some of them have my goals, uh, you know, my goals for future scenes. Some of them are just, just plain thoughts, but a lot of it is, 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 is just brick and mortar stuff. Um, but you can see that there's, I mean, for every book, I, I do maybe uh, 50 of these sheets. I mean, I got reams of this stuff. It's, it's you know, a lot of burnables, I guess. I don't know. Uh, over here, uh, here's some of my records. I, I, uh, I didn't used to be able to listen to music when I wrote, uh, but then I didn't used to be able to drink when I wrote either. I've somehow managed to I mix all my favorite things now. So I come out here two nights a week to the cabin. We're up in the uh, uh, Olympic uh, foothills, uh, uh, squim, and I, uh, I write about 16 hours a day, two days a week. Like Wednesday, Thursday, I do 16 hour days, man. So I, I, I get up at nine in the morning, I write till three in the morning. Then I wake up the next day and do the same thing. And then I'll do that for half a Friday, but then the family arrives Friday. We spend the weekend here, we go back. Now you know the logistics of my life. Okay, TMI. Um, over here, sometimes when I need a break, uh, sometimes when I need a break from, um, you know, say I need a story break or something like that. I come over here to the uh, shuffleboard table and uh, I just kind of zen out, man. I just, I play myself games. And it's kind of sad, a 52 year old man getting drunk by himself playing shuffleboard, but this is how it happens, people. I'm just sorry to demystify the process for you, but there it is. Um, well, anyway, that's my garage. And uh, this is where I write 40 hours a week. So uh, rather than do like a, you know, Zoom presentation or something where you, you guys had to, you know, look at my double chin for 45 minutes, I thought uh, we'd mix it up a little. So my nephew, Matt, he just, uh, he, he just gonna kind of follow me around today a little. Uh, we're gonna talk about process. So I'm gonna do some reading, but for me, it always starts with character. Every, every book, no matter how different all my books are. And, and I, I always try to be different with every book. You know, I wanna swing for the fences and, and kind of play in a high stakes game. So. Uh, I want to get out of my comfort zone. They say, you know, well, write what you know, but I believe, you know, use what you know, but but write outside of your comfort zone. For for me, that's the whole purpose, because like I, I, that that's that that I think is what makes fiction so unique among all arts is that it is I think the greatest empathic window humanity has ever created. Uh, nothing asks you to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes quite as intimately as the novel does. And it's a dance between the reader and the writer, you know? So, so we're not writing in a vacuum, at least I'm not. I'm writing to connect on the other end of that. Character is plot to me, there's no difference. To me, to me, you know, everything that we call plot is just, uh, you know, you start with a character, uh, 
and, and you start with their reality. You know, this is their reality. This is what they wake up to every day. Uh, this is their job. Uh, these are the circumstances of their lives. And over here, we have their idealized self. This is the person they want to be. And so this is the ultimate goal of every character is to develop, you know, and self-realize for me, no matter whether it's West of here, where there's 48 characters or, or something more intimate, like uh, Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, where it's just, you know, one first person protagonist. It's always about, you know, the character moves through this, uh, moves through this, narrative landscape and, and 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 I just put as many obstacles in their way as I can uh, and every time that character makes a decision that decision complicates their journey more and these are the these are the these are the mechanisms of plot these decisions I mean character ultimately is decision uh, like uh, you know I mean characterization is you know the guy wears Hawaiian shirts and you know I mean he has a, a verbal tick or something like that. But like the, the really character comes at the end of the day is about decisions. And so that's what plot is for me. I set, I set my characters free in, in, in this narrative landscape, which is just full of uh, potentialities. And, and they make the decisions that the story turns on. And uh, I don't always have control over that. You know, I mean, I, I don't, you know, view my characters like Nabokov. I don't, I don't see them as, as my galley slaves. You know, I want them to surprise me. Uh, the key for me is to, to create them fully enough that they're alive off the page and that they live inside me. And I, I that's why I write is to become a more expansive person. So I get to, I get to inhabit these characters and I get to accrue what, fe accrue what feels like, you know, genuine experience without ever getting out of my sweats. You know, it's, it's the greatest thing. And that's why I wrote seven or eight books before anybody ever published me. And that's why uh, I keep writing after anybody stops publishing me. I, I do it because I have to, because I get to, I, I get, it makes me a better husband. It makes me a better dad. Um, it, it, I, it makes me a better friend. I, I grow through writing fiction. And if I ever stopped growing through writing f fiction, then, then I think, and it ever felt like I was going through the motions, uh, that's, that's the day I'd stop, you know, because I, there's gotta be a better way to make money. Let me tell you, uh, I, I, yeah, but I, it hasn't happened yet. 14, 15 books or something. And it hasn't happened yet. I'm as excited about the stuff I'm working on today as I, as I was in my twenties. I have to admit, I actually, it's a little embarrassing for me to talk about craft and, and process and stuff. Cause I, I just, I feel, I don't know, kind of precious. <laughs> I mean, there is craft and there's process and all this, but like at the end of the day, it's really just about stacking bricks for me. I mean, it's just like working hard, powering through. I mean, a lot of my writing days are just, you know, it's a slog, uh, you know, I mean, just writing exposition, it can be really hard, but at some point, if I just keep powering through and, and I can get back inside the story, then I'm living it. And then, then, then it's like, then everything just happens. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't want the reader to smell the coffee on my breath. You know what I mean? I don't want to smell the coffee on my own breath when, when, when I'm, you know, so I don't like to think about the, 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 the craft and what I'm doing here. You know, you know, why don't I try the prismatic lens here and see how that works? I don't, you know, I mean, I'm aware of the point of view I'm telling the story for. I'm aware of the environment, but mostly the, like the craft part of it is stuff I've just internalized, stuff I've learned to do mostly f by failing. And <laughs> boy, I am still, Finding new ways to do that every time, man. I mean, you know, my 13th book I wrote, 13 in, you'd think I'd be, you know, but no, I, I failed. I had to throw it away, drag it into the trash. It was useless. Some great world building, some good characters. The, the writing was fine. It just did, the center didn't hold. And, uh, you know, so 12 books didn't, you know, teach me any magic formula. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll fail again. I'm still failing every day. I mean, the book I'm writing right now will end up being like 600 pages long. And by that time, it, I, you know, I will have probably written 1800 pages to get that 600. I mean, I just did a dump like, I don't know, a couple months ago where I literally went through a draft of the novel and I dumped 55,000 words, which is, you know, a novel. I mean, that's, you know, that was uh, 200 and something pages. I just lopped off and, you know, that was a good day's work for me. You know, it only took a half hour to, to cut 185, 200, whatever, how many pages off the book. Uh, I talk a lot about getting out of my own way and, um, I, that's that's how I feel about the actual writing too. the sentences like on a sentence level uh, at this point I mean I've written millions and millions of words at this point I, I, I don't want to work my sentences too hard you know I don't want to write in purple prose I don't it's I'm not trying to be a poet 
and that's not to say that the pros aren't super important to me. I mean, they're the, I, I just view the, I, I view the, I view the words as the blood that runs through the story. They're there to serve the story. And I just want it to swing, you know, I want it to have the rhythm and pulse of the story. So, you know, I'm not gonna, uh, uh, you know, I, I, people's thoughts aren't always gonna be the smoky chiaroscuro of, uh, you know, uh, nostalgia or so, you know what I mean? Sometimes people are just gonna, what am I trying to say here? I, I, I see I'm not very good with words. That's the problem. Uh, I just mean that you know if I'm writing action, I'm it's going to be probably short clip sentences. And if I'm if 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 I'm writing something of a meditation, yeah, maybe I'm going to let the sentences breathe a little bit. Maybe I'll work those sentences a little harder. But it's got to be some sort of poignant moment. I mean, somebody can't just be turning on a lamp and there's this beautiful prose. That doesn't work for me. Anything that is obtuse, anything that. Uh, distracts the reader and takes them, you know, reminds them that they're reading, uh, that's my enemy. I just, I really want to give myself, as I want to give myself to the story, I want, I want the, on the other end of this partnership, I want the reader to, to own the narrative. I want the reader to, to feel the same thing that I feel when I'm, I'm writing it, which is that they're accruing the experience, that this is a real and genuine experience. And they're having this sort of empathic transfer with somebody at the other end, but they get to own it. It's theirs. Um, like uh, the the greatest compliment I ever got from a writer for you know about my writing was one time I got this letter from this guy, and he was like I was I was driving through San Bernardino Valley and I uh, I passed the big dinosaurs at Cabo Zone and I was thinking back on high school and a night I had spent there, and the girl I was in love with but I couldn't remember who the girl was. And then I thought, no, that isn't me. What, what, what was I doing in San Bernardino in high school? It must have been something a friend told me. And I remembered all the details now. There was this other guy there. He was playing bass. And it was just such a memorable night. We were drinking rum. And then he's like, but I don't have any friends that live in San Bernardino either. And that is when the guy figured out he was remembering a scene from All About Lulu. And I'm like, yes, that's what I'm looking at. You know, that's what I want to accomplish. If I could accomplish that every time, I feel like I'd be winning. You know what I mean? That, 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 uh, the work comes out the page and is vivid enough in somebody that, that, that they can own it as their own experience and, 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 you know, recall it with that sort of vividness and immediacy. Art and commerce, um, that is an awkward dance. Uh, but at least it's a dance now, you know, for 20 years, <laughs> I didn't have a partner. There was no commerce, it was just art. Um, but like I produce it at a pretty fast rate. And, and, and one of the reasons I do that is because the longer I'm in publishing and the more success I have, the more voices there are around me saying, well, that worked. Why don't you try something like that? I always want to write what I want to write. And what I want to write is what I'm compelled to write or what, I, what, what, what the dilemmas I want to explore, or the characters I want to live in. And I don't want anybody to ever dictate that. So I always stay two novels ahead. So uh, for me, so much of the work is, is off the page. And that's, that's, you know, that's why I need big chunks of time to write because I, I need to, it's really about, I, I live inside the story and that's hard to do uh, in, in two hour snatches, you know? I mean, I spend a lot of time when I come out here for my two and a half days, you know, uh, of writing. I come out here and I spend, you know, a lot of that um, is time just spent walking in the woods, cogitating uh, or, you know, just throwing shuffleboard and, and, just, and, and just, you know, sinking inside of it and just letting it, you know, essentially just, it takes me some time to get out of my own way. A lot of it is just like game planning, uh, like like just preparedness and best practices. Like uh, I know I'm gonna hit the ground running Wednesday, so I mentally prepare myself like, you know, like an athlete does for, you know, like if I was a football player, it's like just the mental preparation, getting ready to play on Sunday or whatever. That's so much a part of my process is uh, just preparing myself to get out of my own way. And it's, I mean, look at me, I'm a mess. It's, it's hard to get out of my own way sometimes. Uh, so I'm going to read an excerpt from my uh, forthcoming novel, uh, which is what my sixth novel, I guess. Uh, it's called uh, Legends of the North Cascades. And um, this excerpt is something I just cobbled together throughout the whole book, but I found that it kind of works as a standalone and, and there's not really any spoilers uh, because this isn't really exactly how the book plays out. Barely a sniff. 27 rushing touchdowns senior year, 12 more through the air, nearly 3,000 all-purpose yards, not to mention over 120 tackles and three interceptions as a linebacker. 
First team all league, second, second team all state, three consecutive 1A state titles, two undefeated seasons, 3.4 GPA, yet barely a sniff from the recruiters, division one or two. Only three contacts senior season and one visit, unofficial, from Coach Childress from Missouri s and a school that wasn't even on Dave's radar until the night Coach Childress showed up. Coach Childress happened to be in Everett for a funeral, which is probably the only reason he drove the 60 miles to V Falls to watch the vigilantes destroy Lundgren. It wasn't hard spotting Childress beneath the bill of his miner's cap, standing at the chain link fence, the lone black visage amidst 200 or so people gathered that Friday evening under the lights to see the undefeated vigilantes have their way with the lowly tigers. Dave could feel Childress's eyes on him intensely for most of the 75 snaps. Despite the weak competition, Dave did his best to impress. He ran for a pair of TDs, caught another, made a dozen or so tackles, and almost picked off a couple balls in coverage. After the game, Coach Childress, bald beneath his green miner's cap, and fit and toned 55, the slightest shadow of salt and pepper beard, a half foot taller than 15 years younger than Coach Prentice, caught up with Dave in the parking lot after the game. Mr. Cartwright, he said, catching Dave's attention. Oh, hey, hi, said Dave. Childress extended a sturdy hand. You look really comfortable in coverage, he said, especially on that third and three midway through the third quarter. You showed good instincts. Thanks, said Dave. Or maybe it was just a lucky guess. No, sir. How'd you know to drop back into coverage then? His eyes, said Dave. Whose eyes? The quarterback, Fulton. He telegraphed it, didn't even check down to the right side. It was obvious he was looking for the tight end in the seam. You could see over those linemen? Yes, sir. How tall are you anyway? He said, looking down on Dave. 5'11", Dave lied, wishing he were still in cleats. You still growing? Yes, sir. Well, that's good, he said. You got good vision. You ever play any free safety? No, sir. At your size, you gotta take some reps there. Think you're fast enough to cover that much ground? Yes, sir, I do. But in my opinion, it's not about straight line speed, sir. It's that first step that's most important, that break, anticipating and committing to your target. Oh, said Coach Childress, genuinely delighted. And how do you do that? Mostly I watch, sir, and I listen. And I get to know the schemes and the route trees and the spreads at the line of scrimmage and so forth. Then I look for tendencies. Coach Childress smiled. Student of the game, I like that. Thank you, sir. What's the biggest crowd you ever played for? I couldn't say, sir. 8,000? No, sir, said Dave, not even close to that. That's what all good Bailey holds. Phelps County loves their miners, let me tell you. Ever spent any time in Missouri? No, sir. Beautiful, he said, God's country. I'd like to see it, sir, said Dave. And Dave wasn't lying, not even a little. From that moment in the parking lot forward, he'd just as soon have seen Kel Phelps County as Palo Alto or Berkeley. Never mind that he never heard of Phelps County or Rolla, Missouri before that night. He was already in love with them. Dave could hardly sleep that night after meeting Coach Childress. Dave was ready to commit. Pac-10, Big Ten, and SEC be damned. All Dave needed was a chance to prove himself on a bigger stage. And to that end, playing for Coach Childress in Missouri S&T seemed like his deliverance. Dave was okay with being undersized. He'd always anticipated being the underdog at the next level. He understood that Vigilante Falls was a small place, that there were 10,000 bigger places out there in America with bigger and faster guys than him that played in tougher leagues against stiffer competition. But Dave also understood that on a football field, he had the ability to see things happen before they actually happened. And he possessed that rare ability to slow the game down. He also knew that he hated losing and that those two qualities in tandem could make for something special, just as Coach Prentice had always taught him. But neither Coach Childress nor anyone else at Missouri s &T ever followed up with Dave. Looking back, that was the first domino to fall. It was tempting to curse the universe for making him 5'9", or for consigning his origins to the little backwater of V Falls, where he could never distinguish himself to the larger world against real competition. But Dave never once cursed his fate or his humble beginnings, for they were who he was, the forces that put the fire in his belly and the chip on his shoulder. Even after walking away from football, Dave felt lucky for having, having ever enjoyed the privilege of strapping on those pads and excelling at the thing he loved to do more than anything in the world, 
to lose himself and find himself all at once, to know his role and surrender himself to the larger cause, and most importantly, to engage fully in the act of play, to embrace the concept of winning in a world that was mostly about losing, and to do it all in front of most everyone he'd ever known or loved. How could he consider himself anything but lucky? To make his people proud, to gratefully accept their adoration, even their financial contributions, to absorb their hopes vicariously. It was never anything to be taken for granted. No, it was something to accept gratefully, gracefully, like his mom taught him, whether on the sidelines, in the hallway, or in the supermarket. Even through the quiet, unsure days of summer, when the calls and the letters didn't come from colleges far or near, Dave knew he was lucky. Not that he wasn't worried sick about his future, not that the panic didn't keep him up most nights, not that he had any idea what he'd do with his life if the opportunity never came knocking. Dave did his best to hide his anxiety from his mom and his little brother and Nadine and his brother Jerry and Dave's friends and teammates and boosters and pretty much everybody but Coach Prentice. Coach Prentice was a rock through the dark days. Dave called him almost nightly through summer, even as the window was closing. Still nothing from Coach Childress? Nothing new, I'm afraid, but this ain't over, Dave. It feels over, said Dave. That's no way to talk, boy. Coach, I appreciate all you've done for me. Well, I'm not done yet, but that's where the winning ended. Coach Prentice may have been the last person to ever believe in Dave. Then came fall, that dreadful, unimaginable season of dying light, and Dave, with no plans, still alone at home with his mom and his little brother, with no foreseeable future in Rollo, Missouri or anywhere else, not even in V Falls, not so much as a job at the Texaco or Vern's or washing dishes at, da at Dale's. Grander things. Even before the 55 minute drive, a sense of significance had attached itself to the recruitment meeting in Bellingham, a formality, this was bigger than football. This was the rest of Dave's life. The moment he walked through the glass door and into the nondescript recruiting center with its queasy overhead light, he sensed an intensity on the part of the recruiter whom, with a slight limp, met him halfway across the foyer. The Marine bore a certain respectful gravity, epitomized by his dress blues and his clean-shaven square jaw, which had not gone even the slightest bit jowly in spite of what Dave guessed to be his 50 years. As Dave sat down opposite the recruiter with a firm handshake, Dave once again wished he were in cleats and a helmet. Well, let's not beat around the bush, said the recruiter flatly. What do you have to offer the United States Marine Corps, Mr. Cartwright? Well, sir, that's what I'm here to find out. What I can tell you right off the bat is that I try to excel at whatever I do and that I always give 110%. And why is that? Well, sir, because I feel like I've got a responsibility responsibility to try my hardest. Was your daddy a Marine? No, sir. Leaning back slightly, the recruiter reposed in his chair, considering Dave through steely gray eyes. While we're at it, tell me a little bit about your daddy, he said. Not much I could tell, sir. He left when I was three years old. Left who? My mother and me, my baby brother, I guess. Left where? Just left, sir, said Dave. Idaho for a while. I'm not really sure. What about you, said the recruiter. You see yourself providing for children someday? Someday, yes, sir. But not right away. No, sir. You want to travel first, probably. See the world. Cruise some experience. Figure out a plan. Is that it? Yes, sir. One thing I know is that I'd like to have a game plan in this life, sir. And why is that, Mr. Cartwright? I believe in preparation, sir. I think a person ought to mind whatever might possibly be within his or her control so that he better his chances of success. So you've been preparing yourself to be a Marine? Well, not exactly, sir. The recruiter considered this information as though it may or may not have been significant. You have a girlfriend, a wife, he said. A girlfriend, said Dave. What's her name? Nadine, sir. What does Nadine think about you up and joining the US Marine Corps? To be honest, she doesn't love the idea, sir. But when I explained the long game to her, she, the long game? Yes, sir, the benefits of enlisting. Mm, he said. The steady paychecks, eh? The reimbursements? Yes, sir. You'd like to own a home someday? Absolutely, said Dave. Once again, the recruiter considered him with steely gray eyes. Tell me, he said, what does the word responsibility mean to you, Mr. Cartwright? 
Well, generally speaking, sir, it means that you fulfill your commitments. And to whom are you committed? For starters, my mom, my little brother, Nadine. What about your country? Yes, sir, of course. And why is that, said the recruiter, looking him in the eye. Because I love America, said Dave. Oh, yes, sir. And why do you love America? Because it's the greatest country on earth, sir. Because in America, you can be anything you want if you work hard enough. Anything? Well, I suppose almost anything, said Dave. And how can you serve America in return, Mr. Cartwright? However it asks me to, sir. Whatever my job is, that's what I'll do. Mr. Cartwright, can you tell me about a time when you demonstrated leadership? Yes, sir, I can, said Dave, thrilled at the opportunity to talk about the thing he loved most. I played football in high school, sir, both sides of the ball. On defense, I played linebacker, sometimes end, depending on the opponent and how he matched up. Either way, sir, it was my responsibility to set the defense on the fly, to delegate in the event of an audible or a formation that was unfamiliar. It was up to me to tell the safety to drop back or cheat in or tell the lineman what to look for and so forth based on what I was seeing. The recruiter looked mildly impressed, nodding his square head twice. You, so you guessed? Not exactly guessed, sir. It was always an informed decision. And what if you were misinformed? What if you decided wrong? Well, sir, then you got beat. And it happened from time to time, but not very often if you prepared enough. The recruiter nodded his head gravely. It's an observable truth, Mr. Cartwright, said the recruiter, that sometimes you just get beat. Yes, sir. And when that happens, you learn from it. You don't get caught off guard twice the same, same way. At least not if you play for Coach Prentice. You like playing for this Coach Prentice? Yes, sir, I love playing for him. And why is that? Well, sir, it wasn't that just he was a great coach. He was a great man. Almost like a father, said the recruiter. Yes, sir, now that you put it that way. The recruiter silently appraised him for a moment. So, no football scholarship? No, sir, said Dave, feeling his face color. Why not? Well, sir, you're looking for bigger players is what it mostly amounts to. If you're not good enough for college football, what makes you think you're good enough to be a Marine, son? Dave was blushing harder than ever now. With all due respect, sir, I believe I have some very good qualities to offer beyond leadership. Like what? Like commitment, sir, and determination. What Coach Prentice calls grit. Grit, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I suppose that's something, said the recruiter. In the coming weeks and months, Dave came to know the recruiter as Sergeant Sanderson, with whom he met on four or more occasions to talk, and once to work out, and once to play a game with little plastic chits marked by printed words such as responsibility and opportunity and travel. But the fact is, Dave's enlistment was a foregone conclusion after the first interview, and maybe even before it. As it was with the miners of Missouri S&T, so it was with the Marines. Dave was nothing if not decisive. What Dave remembers most about these meetings with Sergeant Sanderson was the weight and formality of them, the sense of legacy that surrounded the USMC, the quiet self-assurance of Sanderson himself, whom, unlike Coach Childress, never once tried to wow Dave with the promise of heroism. The USMC was about grander things than football. It was historic. It was about building a solid foundation for life, about seeing the world, about finding a career, about buying a house, and someday starting a family. At the time, fresh out of options and looking for a game plan, joining the Marines didn't seem like a dicey bargain to Dave. On the contrary, it seemed like the most practical, honorable, and most rewarding opportunity available to him at 19. No place like home. Dave heard the access van pull up in the driveway. Snatching his own pack off the counter, he straightened his empty pant leg before wheeling out the kitchen door and down the ramp. Arnie was already lowering the lift as Dave rolled down the drive. Morning, Dave, he said. Yes, it is, Dave said. Live to see another. I hear that, said old Arnie, flashing a long-toothed, tobacco-stained smile. Dave's heart beat just a little bit stronger as he buckled himself in. He never would have believed it three months ago, but sometimes we really were made stronger through our suffering. Sometimes our losses actually could make us whole again. On the bus ride to town, 
Dave looked out the window as the clouds began dispersing and the sun crested the mountains, spilling orange and yellow into the valley. In six months or so, they could afford their own house closer to town. Though it was awfully nice of Travers to offer Dave and Bella his rental, Dave wanted to build his life back on his own as much as possible, though he knew, finally, that nobody could ever do anything all by themselves and that they ought not to try if they had any choice. But his pride was still too strong. Arnie dropped in behind Ace Hardware and Dave wheeled off the lift into the sunny morning chill. Out in front of the store, Joe Weddleson, his manager and a heck of a pulling guard in his day, was already busy out front, carting out the barbecues and placing the signage. Dave started across the parking lot in the sunlight, his pack dangling off the back of his wheelchair, ham sandwich and carrots inside, same lunch as Bella, his red work apron rolled up in his lap. Halfway to the garden center, Dave waved to Angie as she carted out the perennials. Angie, who had two teenagers and worked weekends at the Lowe's down in Lundgren, in addition to her 40 hours a week at Ace. Angie was going to be a nature path if she could ever finish her online courses. Angie was going to get an FHA loan and buy four and a half acres of Christmas tree farm once she got out from under the credit card debt and managed to squirrel away 8,000 bucks. Just in front of the handicap spots, Dave paused to look up at the mountains in the light of morning, ghostly streamers of mist clinging to their wooded faces. Somewhere invisible to the eye, the river was burgeoning with a thaw rushing forth from beneath the frozen ground, gathering force as it wended its way down the green valley and into the yawning canyon, still mired in shadows. Mountains and valleys, shadows and light, the pitiless freeze and the merciless thaw. Change was ceaseless, the seasons countless, the outside forces of the world relentless. And yet, nothing was permanent, not Ace Hardware, not Vigilante Falls, not even the North Cascades. Dave slipped into his apron. Leaning forward in his wheelchair, he tied it off, cinching the, night firm, cinching the knot firmly and back. Puffing up his empty pant leg once more, he straightened his name pin before pushing through the double glass doors. Just another day in the life of a legend. Thank you for coming into my garage tonight. And thank you, Bima, for, for having me, Jesse and Quorum. I really appreciate it. Uh, I love doing this. Uh, anything Bainbridge related, I love doing. Bainbridge has been so good to me uh, always, and, and uh, this was fun. A little too much information at times, perhaps. I'm, I apologize for that. But uh, thank you for, for letting let me talk at y'all, and, and thank you. Where is everybody?